talks on psychoanalysis shares topics published in the IPA Society journals and Congress debates worldwide, brought to you in the voices of the original authors. We hope this window will allow you to experience the depth and breadth of psychoanalytic thought around the world. I am Gaetano Pellegrini and today's episode is about the analyst fear of intimacy, the inner obstacle to initiating and deepening an analysis, is about identity and practice. We will hear from Lena Theodoro Ehrlich on her book Psychoanalysis from Inside Out. Lena Theodoro Ehrlich is a training and supervising analyst at the Michigan Psychoanalytic Institute, visiting faculty at the Denver Psychoanalytic Institute and clinical supervisor at the University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry. She is nationally and internationally recognized for her original contribution to the literature on beginning and deepening analysis and building and maintaining a psychoanalytic practice. Her recent paper, Teleanalysis, Slippery Slope or Rich Opportunity, won the 2019 Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association Prize Award for Excellence in Psychoanalytic Scholarship and Distinguished Contribution to the Journal. Please visit the episode description to find all details, including the author's email address, to send your thoughts. This is Lena Theodoru Ehrlich, recording on a snowy day in an urban Michigan in the United States. I'm thankful to the organizers of this highly informative podcast series for inviting me to participate and offering me the opportunity to communicate with colleagues around the world who share my passion for the practice of psychoanalysis and are invested in its future. And thank you, listener, for your attention. You're welcome to send me your thoughts at my email address. Responding to the widespread pessimism about the feasibility and effectiveness of psychoanalysis, even among analysts, in what follows, I will share my experience of the conditions that can make psychoanalysis possible for analysts and helpful to patients. Years ago, as a first-year candidate, I recognized that becoming and continuing to become an analyst would be challenging. Initially, my concern focused on finding analytic patients. A sense of pessimism about the future of analytic practice and being able to find analytic patients capable of and wanting to be in analysis, already palpable among North American analysts, resonated with my own worries about being a beginner. Who would be willing to engage with me in this long, expensive treatment that provided no guarantees about its success? Searching for reassurance, as a candidate, I set out to understand the practice patterns of recent graduates. I was informed that some of my colleagues did not begin any analytic cases after they graduated, others practiced less analysis than they wanted, and a few had developed robust analytic practices. Although I felt somewhat reassured to know that analysts could still build lively analytic practices, I also noted that only a few graduates were immersed in practicing psychoanalysis. How did they manage? Was it their degree, their prior therapy experience, their talent? Searching for variables that might account for their success, I noticed that recent graduates with identical credentials, experience, and skills had very different levels of immersion, and that analysts who had vibrant analytic practices within the same locale had varied professional backgrounds and qualifications. I realized that external variables alone did not seem to account for the differences. Eager to practice analysis, I became interested in identifying and articulating the internal variables that could affect an analyst's capacity to practice analysis and began by examining my own motivations. Over the years, I have observed in my own clinical work, as well as the work of many others, that internal variables affect all analyst practices and have sought to find answers to the following questions. What allows some analysts to develop and sustain the confidence 
interest and determination to offer and practice analysis, given the internal and external challenges of practicing analytically in today's fast-paced, evidence-based world? What permits some of us to maintain belief in the healing power of analysis after graduation when we no longer have access to and are bolstered by the confidence of our own analysts and supervisors and have had inevitable disappointing experiences in our own analysis and in practicing analysis? In the decades since my graduation, psychoanalysis is practiced increasingly less and has become an even more endangered rare practice. Recent surveys reveal that a great majority of contemporary analysts engage in little or no analysis and often claim that practicing psychoanalysis is no longer feasible. A 2009 Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research study found that 78% of graduate analysts who responded had studied a mean of 1.4 new analytic cases since graduation. A 2006 study of the American Psychoanalytic Association and studies of postgraduate practice patterns from the Cincinnati and Los Angeles Institutes offer similar patterns of practice. Many analysts maintain that the decreasing number of individuals in psychoanalysis suggests that patients are no longer interested in analysis. Because of the time, energy, and cost involved, prospective patients choose shorter, easier, and less expensive treatments. Exchanges between analysts in listserv conversations, roundtable discussions, and personal communications discussing the impossibility, impracticality, and unpopularity of analysis also reveal profound discouragement and pessimism about the effectiveness of psychoanalysis in general, and for some explicitly of their ability to be of help. In a 2020 paper reporting on interviews with early career analysts about their professional and personal development after psychoanalytic training, Sherry and her collaborators write, quote, Disillusionment related to the economic and social reality of practicing psychoanalysis emerges from this study as a stark reality. The study shows how this recent graduates experienced the nationwide unavailability of psychoanalytic patients, a shortage stemming from factors including the lack of insurance reimbursement and a shift in a zeitgeist away from long, immersive treatment approaches to mental health. End quote. My book, Practicing Psychoanalysis from the Inside Out, Developing and Sustaining an Analytic Identity and Practice, represents in part my response to this widespread pessimism about the effectiveness, visibility, and even the viability of psychoanalysis as a practice. Integrating my understanding of its limitations and potential for misuse, I communicate my clinical and supervisory experience that psychoanalysis is possible and can be beneficial. With detailed clinical examples, I support my claim that psychoanalysis is unique in its potential to transform patients at an emotionally cellular level by helping them access and process unconscious fantasy and trauma. I demonstrate how the psychoanalytic method and relationship continue to offer an unmatched opportunity to encounter the depths and reach of a patient's emotional suffering and to contain, represent, understand, and repair it. I assert that contemporary psychoanalysis offers not only a viable and effective treatment for emotional conflict or trauma, but further claim that when practiced competently and ethically, has now an ever wider reaching and greater healing potential than ever before. This is because more than a century of experience behind or near the couch has led analysts to a deeper, more nuanced understanding of human suffering and how to be of better help. Studying unconscious conflict, 
narcissism, object relations, attachment, dissociation, mentalization, and represented states, and trauma, among many others, and mining the riches of the analyst countertransferences and projective identifications, has led us to a better appreciation of the complexity of the human mind and the analytic relationship, and to more subtle, effective ways of helping our patients. Having sustained a robust clinical and supervisory practice for 30 years, I share my understanding how analysts can find and nurture our capacity to practice analytically and effectively engage patients and deepen that engagement. My optimism about the feasibility of psychoanalysis derives from my clinical and supervisory experience and from participation in peer consultations and study groups. Keep reflecting on my own work and observing the work of colleagues and supervisees, I have concluded that many obstacles that patients and analysts experience as insurmountable to beginning and continuing analysis are in fact manifestations of fears, of their inner lives and of intimate relationships. Time and again, I have witnessed how analysts, when we anticipate and be emotionally open to perceiving and reflecting on signs of fear, improve our capacity to begin and deepen our analytic work. While acknowledging the many external obstacles to analytic practice, including fewer patients requesting analysis than in its heyday, I demonstrate in my writing that when analysts practice from the inside out, i.e. consider that external obstacles to initiating and deepening an analysis inevitably reflect analyst fears of our internal world and of intimacy, we become better able to speak to patients' long-term suffering and develop fulfilling analytic practices. My book follows a developmental trajectory and is divided in three parts, each containing chapters that address analyst developmental challenges to and opportunities for developing and sustaining an analytic identity and practice at different stages in their careers. In part one, Finding Ourselves as Analysts, I discuss analysts reluctant to initiate new analysis as a critical variable that affects analyst practice. I argue that how analysts think about our functions, our patients, and analytic process determines whether we recommend analysis. In this section, I demonstrate how my reluctance to begin new analysis influenced my thinking and practice, and how I use compelling external realities adverse to analysis to rationalize my reluctance to recommend and engage patients in analysis. I suggest that reluctance to begin an analysis appears to be an underestimated factor in explaining why analysis is not practiced more and consider the analyst's reluctance from different vantage points. As a response to intense affects mobilized by the consultation, as aspect of a co-created enactment, and as a manifestation of the analyst conflicts. I indicate that I have found it clinically useful to anticipate that my hesitancy to analyze would manifest itself with each new patient and to consider also with each patient, how I play a part in the resistance to begin. Widening my outlook, in a second chapter, I propose that analysis begins in the analyst's mind. That is how an analyst thinks about her function, her patients, and the analytic process determines in great measure whether analysis will begin. I maintain that although patients and analysts affect and shape each other from the outset, it's the analyst's responsibility to initiate intensive treatment. Patients depend on the analyst to recognize their need for intensive help, recommend analysis, and facilitate their engagement. I share my experience that as many prospective patients now as ever are seeking intensive help for long-term emotional suffering and when offer intensive treatment and help with the fears of beginning, 
are willing to engage in analysis. Time and again, I have noted that it's not patients' willingness to engage that primarily It's their analyst determination and commitment to do the essential ongoing psychological work to create room in their mind to invite the patients to feel and know the extent of their suffering and help the patients recognize their need for intensive help. A prerequisite to recognizing the measure of patient's pain is understanding the disturbing feelings that are engendered in the initial encounter with each prospective patient. I have observed that an analyst's focus on our own hesitation and fears as an entryway in what frightens the patient, we create more room in our minds to contain our patient's anxieties and without exception, end up doing more analysis. In other words, for analysis to begin, An essential aspect of analyst psychological work involves constantly attending to our own propensity to turn away from what is most disturbing within us and between us and the patient. Analysis must begin in the analyst's mind before a meaningful and sincere invitation for analysis can be made to any patient. And of course, unless analysts recommend and deepen analysis, analysis cannot take place. In instances where the analyst can recommend analysis without grappling meaningfully with the disturbing feelings generated by the initial encounters with the patient, psychoanalysis can begin in form, but not in substance. I describe my experience of how the analyst's emotional investment and capacities make possible the beginning of a back and forth between analyst and patient and allows the latter to engage in a meaningful analysis. I identify six aspects of the analyst psychological work that I have found to facilitate the beginning of analysis. Not denying the extent and depth of the patient's emotional pain. Recognizing the patient's strengths and adaptive capacities. Imagining working helpfully together with the patient having confidence in analysis and one's ability to analyze, seeing beyond the patient's resistances and fears, and appreciating the patient's wish for truth and intimacy. In other words, recognizing the patient's wish to be in analysis. I suggest that appreciating from the outset how much apprehension a close encounter with another's inner world can engender within me, and keeping in mind that this fear is crucial in getting to know the patient, has been a central aspect of my development as an analyst. Having argued that analysis begins in the analyst's mind, I then focus on candidates. In response to surveys indicating that candidates have difficulty finding control cases and maintaining immersion, and that graduate analysts have similar difficulties, I suggest that psychoanalytic training doesn't prepare candidates well enough to find patients and practice analysis while in training, and for most, after graduation. While the external challenges during training can indeed be formidable, I argue that it's by identifying and making use of the internal challenges to finding cases that a candidate can develop the analytic mind necessary, the identity, approach, and skills, not only to graduate, but to be able to practice clinical psychoanalysis post-graduation. Noting that the use of counter-transference is central to any helpful analysis, I propose that we help candidates recognize the value of identifying and making use of transference countertransference dynamics as they consider an individual potential patient and as they search for control cases in general. Candidates expressed many concerns about finding cases, such as, is the patient suitable? Is the analysis practically feasible? Will the case fulfill graduation requirements? I offer several detailed examples illustrate my observation that when we help candidates frame their concern about external obstacles to analysis as possible signs of countertransferential fears and view them as windows into the patient's mind and difficulties, 
candidates are more likely to find patients and engage them. In part two, developing the capacity to deepen in analysis, I focus on the development of the analyst capacity to facilitate the deepening of the analytic process. In this part, I discuss analyst conflicts around preserving and deepening the intensity of the analytic engagement as it is manifested in her reluctance to view changes in the analytic frame as meaningful. More specifically, I propose that no matter how compelling the external obstacles, I find it useful to consider any request for modification of the external frame, the customary way that a patient and I work, as evidence of, at least in part, the patient's anxiety and conflicts. I also find it useful to consider my inclination to accommodate patients' requests for a change in the frame as possible manifestations of my own fears of facing something difficult within myself. With a detailed clinical example, I demonstrate how my continued scrutiny of my reluctance to maintain the analytic frame in terms of frequency and fees allowed me to continue an analysis and deepen the analytic process. In discussing the analyst's capacity to deepen the analysis, I also consider the fast-growing area of teleanalysis, and in contrast to critics of teleanalysis, illuminate how the physical setting, i.e. physical distance or occasional technological difficulties, don't necessarily limit or preclude effective analysis, and in fact, can catalyze it. Comparing analytic process from in-person sessions and teleanalysis, I have found that analysts' emotional engagement and working effectively closely to patients is more consequential than physical distance. Recognizing how analysts and patients use physical distance to create emotional distance provides valuable analytic information. When considered analytically, the feelings and thoughts distance evokes are not insurmountable obstacles. Instead, they can help deepen analysis. In addition, the juxtaposition of the experiences of the in-person and the tele-settings provide increased unique opportunities for analysis because they activate different transference counter-transference wishes, fears, and states of mind. In the third and last part of the book, Sustaining the capacity to listen and intervene analytically, I explore the factors that support or interfere with analysts' ability to sustain an analytic mind and the desire to practice psychoanalysis post-graduation. I suggest that both idealization of analysis and disappointment in analysis can interfere with analysts' capacity to function effectively within or even to engage at all in the practice of psychoanalysis. I share that what has enabled me to continue to practice analysis past graduation has not been just my enthusiasm, but my continued effort to let myself know my disappointments in analysis and my fears of initiating and practicing it. I have relied as much on my confidence in its usefulness as on identifying and analyzing my idealizations about its effectiveness and integrating the realities of its misuses and limitations. Both reservations about its usefulness and the idealizations about its efficacy can serve as resistances to engaging in the psychological work necessary to practice well enough. I have found that idealizations serve to maintain illusions of control and omnipotence and not facing the uncertainty and hopelessness that is part of being present within oneself and showing up emotionally for others. I have found that analysts' idealized expectations of analytic functioning can interfere with our confidence and motivation to engage in analysis. Analysts who think that they should find analytic work easy or that they should not experience ambivalence about practicing or that they should be invariably confident about their practice or able to practice well enough without any consultation, cannot sustain these unrealistic expectations 
and turn away from analysis in disappointment, even despair. I identify several variables that have supported my capacity to immerse myself in analytic practice and function well enough as an analyst. These include anticipating analysis to be effortful, expecting my ambivalence and insecurities, trusting analysis and my capacity to be helpful while being aware of its misuses and limitations, and accepting my need for consultation and reanalysis. I also articulate how working within high analytic frequency, that is four or five times a week, privileging transference countertransference, and being mindful of the tensions and paradoxes of analysis have been critical in helping me uphold a solid enough analytic identity and to sustain a fulfilling analytic practice. Finally, I discussed the usefulness of consultations, which I had identified as one of the important variables that helps sustain analyst capacity and desire to practice analysis over time. Clinical experience and the analytic literature offer irrefutable evidence that countertransference is ubiquitous at all stages in each analysis. I suggest that given what analysts know about the human's mind propensity to fool itself, ongoing consultation must be viewed as essential in practice psychoanalysis. I share examples of my experience of how analysts' practice of consulting with one another about our work proves essential to maintaining ourselves as effective analysts. Here is a compelling example. I'm a member of a study group of 14 experienced analysts from North America, which meets over three-day weekends twice a year. Each group member takes a turn presenting detailed process notes from consecutive weekly sessions from three different points of an analysis. Each presentation begins on Friday afternoon and ends mid-morning on Sunday, typically involving 12 to 13 hours of analytic process from one analysis. As a member of this group, I have listened to more than 30 presentations. Inevitably, by Saturday afternoon, if not earlier, how each presenter's countertransferences limit the analysis have become evident to the group and most of the time to the presenter. Time and again, these presentations reveal that despite years of experience, skill, and confidence, each of us is subject to manifestations of our unconscious. My participation in this group supports my conviction about the omnipresence of the analyst resistances to analysis. It also increases my appreciation of the benefits of ongoing consultation in better understanding how ever-present resistances affect our functioning, as well as their specific meaning in terms of the patients and our own psychology. I have found that frequent consultation with periodic presentations of every patient in one's practice to be an important prerequisite for sustaining a generative engagement in practicing and teaching psychoanalysis. In an era when many people within and outside psychoanalysis have lost faith in its usefulness and feasibility, this book is distinctive in offering an optimistic view of effectiveness of psychoanalysis and of analyst capacity to maintain a satisfying psychoanalytic practice. Thank you very much for listening. Mm-hmm.